are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Just grab your Bibles uh, in whatever form that you use. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Uh, today we're going to look uh, at this passage of Scripture that is one of my favorite scriptures in all of, this, all of the Bible. Uh, you might hear me say that every once in a while. I have a lot of those, and that's okay, right? To have a, more than one favorite scripture. I think God's okay with that. And uh, this is one that has uh, vastly uh, or thoroughly worked me over. It has, has been a challenge in my life in many significant ways, and uh, one in which I want to share with you this morning as we continue our series called Cultivating Habits of the Heart. Really what we're trying to do in this particular series is to understand what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ that passionately pursues all that he has for our lives and in a way that honors him greatly, just like we just finished praying about. We know that Christ has done an amazing work and he's done such a powerful thing to bring us from being enemies of him to draw us into his family, from being sinners without hope to being saved with great hope, uh, this is an amazing, supernatural, miraculous thing that happens to us at the point of conversion. And, and yet, really, what we're trying to, the question we're trying to answer is, what next? What next? After we come to faith in Jesus Christ, what does the rest of, the li- of, of our life supposed to look like as followers of Him who are seeking to passionately pursue Him in all our ways? How do we cultivate uh, godly living in our lives? And throughout this series, we're going to look at a number of things. We're going to look at the importance of community, the importance of our work life, the importance of prayer and the Word, and all of these things um, are are adding up to uh, what our hearts should be. But today, I want us to look at this identity that we have in Jesus Christ and how it powerfully alters and transforms uh, not just who we are, but then how we live life afterwards. When I was in high school... Um, I had some friends who were uh, a year or two older than I that, that went off to college, and they went to a college that was somewhat close to where our high school was. And so uh, one time they said, hey, why don't you come and, uh, and hang out with us at college? And us lowly high schoolers thought, well, wow, that's an incredible thing to be able to go to the university and hang out with the students there. Like, that's, that's an amazing privilege. And, and we knew because we were just lowly high schoolers that didn't have really any reason or shouldn't have any ability to walk on this campus because we were losers, okay, playing that up a little bit, right? That, that we, would have to, we would have to do something to make it seem like we belonged, right? Anybody ever been in one of those situations where you're like, I'm going somewhere new, I'm going somewhere different, I know I don't really belong, but I need to do something to make sure it seems like I belong. Have you been there? I think we've all been somewhat in there. We've at least been uncomfortable enough to think about that, right? And so, I remember we we had this, like, uh, all of a sudden, all my buddies who had no interest in what clothing styles were and and, and how to look, and, like, suddenly it was a thing. Like, we had to figure out how to fit into this particular thing. And so we had to to dress the part, and and I remember this, like, a bunch of, like, this is something that the ladies usually talk about. Us guys, we never talked about this stuff. And suddenly it was like, we had to figure this thing out, and we had to get help. And so we had, to, we had to get dressed up to be something that we weren't, to go to hang out with friends at a place that we knew we didn't belong, and, and um, it didn't go well. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Like, it, like we got there, it was, it was fun, it was crazy, and the whole time we knew we didn't belong, and everybody there knew we didn't belong either. It didn't work. Like that putting on of new clothes and new stuff just didn't, didn't actually help us in any way. I think many times uh, as we look at the Christian life, we kind of think like, I don't think I really belong there. And so I try to dress the part, I try to play the part, but it doesn't, it doesn't always work. Like sometimes people can tell. And um, as we look at this passage of Scripture today, I think it's important to help us understand that God wants to cultivate into our hearts uh, an understanding of what we have in our identity, and then he calls us to live out that identity in a faithful way. So let's read this together this morning as we, let's just get an understanding here, and then I'm going to actually pick just a few verses to help us here, and then actually we're going to study this passage, I think, as I've been looking at it, for the next two or three Sundays, we're going to kind of park ourselves here and kind of get an understanding 
Um, we'd be here all day if I were to preach this passage one time through, and I don't think you really want to do that. And so let's just read all the way through and then focus on, a, uh, on one significant part of it. Look at Colossians chapter 3 with me this morning. It says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So what we have here, really, is an understanding of what our identity in Jesus Christ is, and then the results of that identity, the, 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 re, the outward realities are, are presented, but not before we understand the inward heart things that have gone on or, or at, a, at a point of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so, write this down this morning. We're going to talk, I, I want to I talk and teach you uh, around this idea today. Uh, it's the main idea of our sermon. If you have notes in your bulletin, pull them out and write this statement down. It says this, My identity as a Christ follower requires new habits of living. My identity as a Christ follower requires new habits of living. So um, here today we have this awesome proclamation of Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism. There were four people today who have said, listen, we believe Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He, he's the way, the truth, and the life. How many of you here today believe that? Raise your hand. We don't want them to feel alone, like this is something that only they proclaim and we can't proclaim it to. Go ahead, raise them high. Raise them high. You believe Jesus Christ, okay? I, listen, if, if that's not you today, you can put them down. Uh, that's fine. We're thrilled that you're here, that you would learn and hear these things. There's no shame in that. We would want you to hear the truth of God's Word today and to be convicted in His Spirit to uh, understand the new identity that you have. And we, we thank you for being honest in not saying that as well. We think that's an important thing, to, to understand where you stand before God, to know that honestly and be able to say that because there are vast and significant things that occur when your identity is shaped by Jesus Christ. When you can say, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ, there, there are some significant implications that, that come from that. And, and let's start with this. If you're taking notes today, write this down. This is, we'll, we'll talk around this for a second. We see this in the text. Let me say it, and then I'll point it out to you in the Scripture. Number, point number one today says, I am commanded to put off the old self and put on the new self. So we see from this pa particular passage of Scripture that you are called to put off old self things and put on new self things. And you say, well, Pastor Nate, Pastor Nate, like, like that's, that's something you're talking about, outward things. Correct. Because what's inside impacts what you are on the outside. That's what we see here. 
Let me show you from Scripture so you're not just taking my words for it, right? Not, not the preacher. He's not the authority here. What's the authority? God's Word, right? God's Word's the authority. So look at verse 9 and 10 of Colossians chapter 3 with me. It says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you... Here, here's the point right here. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its, its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its Creator. So do you see that here today? Like, this isn't like me coming up with some like saying that you need to write down. I, I want you to write down the things that are in God's Word. And so the thing we wrote down is, I am commanded to put off the old self and put on the new self because, because really what Scripture is calling us here is that we should dress ourselves spiritually to meet the spiritual identity that we have. So you get the idea of putting off and putting on, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of like the idea of clothes. And, and so, like, I have this shirt on right here today, and because we did baptisms, I, I wasn't sure how wet I was going to get. And by the way, uh, I, I didn't get wet. I did fantastic this time. Sometimes I stand up here after baptism, like, soaking wet, cold because it's so air-conned in here, right? Like, like, I'm really proud of how unwet I didn't get today. But, but if I got soaking wet, I came prepared to put on a completely different shirt today because, because it, needed, it, it needed a change, right? I, I would be freezing cold up here, and it would look silly to be completely soaking wet. And, and so I would need to take off this item of clothing and put on the next item of clothing. And, and what Jesus is really saying here in this particular text, he's helping us understand that there are some outward things that he's going to want us to take off and some outward things that he's going to want us to put back on because of the new internal reality that he has given to us. Now, now this is a powerful thing when we understand, um, when we understand it. My, dress myself spiritually to meet my spiritual identity. Put off the old self because that's not my spiritual identity anymore. And, and put on new self things because that is now my spiritual identity. And, and so it, it's kind of like a wealthy man I read the story. This is for real. A wealthy man, a number of years ago, in the United States, in the state of California, who owned much of the property in town and over time had sold it to various people. And as the town had grown, he became more and more wealthy because of how much land he had owned and then leased and sold. And, and he was known as like the man in town. And one time, he, he, he took a piece of property of his and he turned it into a golf club, into a country club. And and so he owned the country club, even though he had sold a lot of other properties around it, he owned the country club and regularly played on it. And if you know anything about golf country clubs, are you allowed to show up in like most country clubs? Sandals, cut off jeans, holes in your t-shirt? No, 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 you gotta, you gotta show up and dress the part, right? And so, so that was one of the rules at this country club. And one day, one of the stewards of the club found a man standing out on the greens in like old raggedy clothes. And he was like, well, that breaks the rules. And immediately he called the police and they had the man come because of trespassing and they, they grabbed him and, and took him down to the police station. He was not quite arrested, but almost because it was the owner in scruffy clothes at the golf course. But, but he was the owner and, and his outward looking appearance of clothes would seem to say he didn't belong, he didn't own it, and so they, they mistaken identity, they, they took him and arrested him down, and then they realized their mistake. No, he's actually, he actually owns the whole place. Like, if he wants to show up in dirty clothes, he can. His identity was as owner, but what he looked like was very different. And many times, that's how we are. We have Christ, but we live in such a way. Our habits are such that they're just scruffy, Clothes that look like rags, stuck in sin and old style living. And what Christ is calling us to here is, no, that's not the way we live. We live according to our identity. Another way to think of it is, I have a drawer, or I had a drawer. Um, men, you can relate to me on this. Wives, you re relate to my wife's part in this. I have a, had a drawer full of clothes, of t-shirts, all, all the way back from like high school and college. And uh, when we came to move to Malaysia, I see the smiles on your face there. When we came to Malaysia, I was like, yeah, we're taking this drawer of clothes. And my wife is, no, you are not. <laughs> like, this is the opportunity to get rid of them. I say, well, why would we get rid of them? These are like my t-shirts from like, uh, no, no, you are getting, no, but I can just use them to work and I won't wear them out, I promise. 
And, and, and she's like, no, we are getting rid of these things because they are the old things and we have new things and you don't even fit those anymore. So she had a point. We got rid of most of them. I still have a few. But the old had to go. Interesting, we just baptized some people today, and in the early church, one of the things that became a custom, this isn't biblical in any way, but one of the things that became a custom, I think it was a decent practice, is that many times the people who were baptized would come, and they would come in their old clothes. And yet when they showed up and they arrived and they were baptized, they were baptized in their old clothes, but then they were immediately, collection was taken, there was a fun set up, there was a new white robe waiting for them as they came out of the water, and they would take the person's old clothes, and they would actually burn them, signifying this very concept right here. Put off the old, put on the new, and just in a tangible way, they showed and demonstrated that because really what this text is calling us to, this whole section, all 17 verses, is trying to help us understand that you are to dress yourself spiritually to meet the spiritual reality of where you are. And so if you're here today and you raised your hand earlier, you said, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ, I believe that, what this text is calling you to is then to live in that way. Now, many times we get this mixed up. Many times we reverse that whole thing and we think, if I live in a certain way, then that means I'll be saved and then I'm good to go. But is that what the Scripture teaches? Like, can you do anything to earn the grace gift of salvation through Jesus Christ? Like, could you come to church enough times to earn that? Could could you go and say sorry enough times to the things you've done wrong in the past to do that? That's impossible, right? Could could you say, okay, you know what, I'm just not going to do that anymore, and I'm just going to not do it better than I've ever not done it before? Could you do that enough? No, no, no. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's not a matter of like, I do something over here, and then I get to be saved, and so now I'll be baptized. That's not what this text is teaching at all. What's it teaching? teaching this. You come to faith in Jesus Christ and you get a whole brand new identity over here and now I need to back that up with the way I live, not because I lose it in any way, not because it changes me in any way. It's just I have this new identity. I have to now start living it differently and I have to put on the right clothes and take off the wrong clothes. You understand what the clothes are here, right? Did you read the lists? Like They're pretty clear. I love the fact that in these lists, the things that we're being told to be put off, at first it starts off with like, oh my goodness, big things, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetous, okay? But, but look at verse 8. <laughs> it's also anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth, lying. So it's not just avoiding big bad things. It, 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 it's putting off all the things that are different than a holy God. And that's why when Peter writes, be holy because I'm holy, he's writing the words of God, right? He, he, he's telling us that we are called to holiness. That Listen, it, it is not wrong to pursue godliness in your life. There, there are times where somehow we get this idea of grace so mixed up that we think, well, God's going to just always forgive everything, and, and, and he does forgive for sure, but, but can I just tell you, like the, the, the fact that he gives us grace doesn't excuse the fact that we have a responsibility to live differently. My identity as a Christ follower requires that I form new habits in my life, that I live out the reality that is true of me. And so this command that we're being given here this powerful command that we're being given here. Listen, don't mix up the order of things. It's because you have a new identity that you're called to live differently. If you don't have a new identity, hey, stop faking it. Just be who you are. Like, like honestly, I'd, I'd be way better with that, and I'll be a better friend to you because of that. Just be who you are. I don't believe Jesus, and I don't have to live that way. Just do that. I'm okay with that. So many people are tripped up by the faking it type of thing, and honestly, like, doesn't impress really anybody, and it sure doesn't impress the God who knows all things. So let's just stop the fake stuff, and let's go for the reality of what we are. So what are we? We've referenced it a number of times in our service today, in the singing, in the baptisms, 
but let me just make it crystal clear for us here today from another verse of Scripture. It, it, it's here as well, but I think this one, this is like one of my favorites. Can I just, can we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for a minute? It's going to be up on the screen too. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. If you don't have this verse to memory, like I would suggest that this is a great one to put to memory, okay? It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So, so let's just get really crystal clear on this identity thing. If anyone is in Christ, he's what? Go ahead, shout it out. New creation. There, there's, a, there's a whole new life created there. Now, now you didn't like actually die physically in any way and then come back to all that. Like, that didn't happen so it's not talking about your physical life in any way. What, what's this new creation talking about? It's, it's talking about your spiritual life. You understand that you have a spirit, right? You have a soul. You're not just a physical being. And, and that's, what's, that's, what, that's all new. That's the new creation that's being talked about here because we just read in Romans 6 about baptism. If you've been baptized in Christ, you've been put to death like him. He's talking about your spiritual Like nobody actually physically died in that pool, right? So it's a, it's a spiritual death that's being talked about, but you don't just get the dead things put away, you get new life as well. So that's why it says you're a new creation, and then to, for clarity here, the old has passed away. That's the pass away, right? Death. The old has passed away. Behold, whenever you see the word behold in Scripture, it means look up and pay attention, okay? Behold, behold, the new has come. That's awesome. That's the new identity that we have in Christ Jesus. That, that, that's why we celebrate things like baptism because it, it's not just some ritual thing that you do to get in the club. It's not that at all. It's new life. And it's amazing. And so we've seen today this new identity that we have. We've commanded to put off some things because of it and put on some new things as a result of it. And, and the reason, here, write, that, write this down, number two here, flip your paper over. The reason is what? I've been saying this all morning. You should know what the answer is. The reason is, I have a new what? I have a new, let's say it, I have a new identity. Sorry, I thought it was up on the screen. I didn't realize you were there. Didn't, you were still lost. It's like, why is everybody lost? Okay, now we're not lost. There we go. The reason is, I have a new identity. I'm going to ask you the question, you answer it. Nice and loud, okay? Full voice. Everybody's in the sermon right now. What's the reason? I have a new... You're in the sermon. You're in the sermon. Come on, come on. In the sermon, okay? Let's try it again. What's the reason? Because I... I have a new identity. I know I have a new identity. This is a powerful thing. And, and, and I believe that Colossians, the whole book, is trying to help us understand our identity in Christ. Chapter 3 just happens to be kind of those pinnacle moments where we, we've heard all the theological reasoning in chapter 1 and 2, and then 3 is putting it together for us in, in significant ways. But look at the beginning of chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. This is where we see this new identity in significant ways. It says here, if then, you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. I mean, the amazing thing about this verse is it's telling us about the position that we have once we are this new creation that we just talked about in 2 Corinthians. So, so we have this new identity, this new position, and let me just try to point out to you a couple of phrases that I think will help you understand this. We see here in verse 1, it says, if you've been raised with Christ. Okay, just, just note with Christ. Like, write that down on your notes. With Christ, verse 1. And then it goes down to verse 3. It says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. Okay, so write that down. With Christ, verse 3. And then it says, When Christ, 
Okay, write that down. Verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. Again, with Him. With Him. Listen, one of the most significant portions of understanding the reality of my new identity with Jesus is the with Him aspect. The fact that He is with us always is stunning. I didn't prompt Timotheus at all to read that verse from Deuteronomy earlier in his baptism testimony, but I mean, this is Old Testament, this is New Testament, this is like if you have the identity of Jesus Christ, if you have that identity that's given to you through Jesus Christ, He is with you in all things in the midst of whatever you're going through on earth. I mean, this is amazing because it centers us as believers on the resurrected life of Jesus. It centers us to help us understand that all reality of the world must first pass through the grid of God with me. He's my identity. Now whatever I do after that needs to represent that thing. Ultimately, your identity in Christ, I would, I would say, would dictate every decision that you make here on earth. Like it's one of those base level, heart level, right to the very core. Like when you understand identity in Jesus Christ, it changes all things about you. So much so that the verses that we just read here, verses 1 to 4, aren't as impossible as they seem. Did you get that feeling, by the way, when you read some of these verses? It says here, um, so set your minds, verse 2, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things on earth. What? Pastor, do you know my mind? Do you understand the ADD thing that I go through? I can't focus on anything. The impossibility of somebody who doesn't have the identity of Christ at the core of themselves is very true in this verse. They would read that verse and go, I can't possibly do that. But if you have Christ with you, you understand that we can be consciously preoccupied with Him in all things so that when I make that next phone call, I'm asking, God, help me. When I make the, have that next conversation, I'm asking, God, would you direct me? When I make that choice about what I'm going to do next in my next five minutes, God is directing those things. And I'm not talking about some pious, religious, anything here. I'm just talking about normal life. Because when my identity is Christ, I am concerned about what that reputation will be and how I live that out ends up driving every part of my life. What we see here is that since you are risen with Christ, seek the things which are above. And when we look at this, can I just clarify something that we don't see in the English, but really it's the idea of continuing to seek it. Like if you were the one, if, understand, if you were to read this in the original letter that Paul wrote, he would have written it in the Greek language, and in the Greek language, the verb that, that tells us to seek would have been one in which we would say, that's not something where I do like one time and I'm done, but it's like continually, continually, continuing to seek, continue to seek the things that are above. Don't stop that. That's somebody that has an identity in Christ they realize we can't stop seeking the things that are above. And when we do, we fall back into putting on old clothes, old ways of living, old habits that are not of God. And the only thing that changes that is when I continue to seek Him. Now, you say, well, how do I do that? Well, it says here, pretty clear, set your mind on the things above. So let me ask you, where... Did God give us help for seeking the things that are above? Where? Where? The Bible. His Word. Again, I, I think we have to understand, like, He has no interest in whether or not you religiously, let's use that term, He's not real thrilled with religion, by the way, religiously, open your Bible every day and read it or not. He's not super concerned with that. He wants to know, are you setting your mind on the things that are above? 
and this is the method, and this is the way, and it's living and active, and it's so sufficient to do all of those things, but, but he's not concerned with whether or not you get to fill out the gold sticker chart with, I've read the Bible every day this week. He's not concerned with that. He's concerned with, did you get your mind on the things that are above? And that happens through God's Word. And I would suggest reading it every day is an important aspect of that. I'm not saying don't read the Bible. I'm just saying that don't mix up the forms here. He, he, he wants you in His Word, but He wants you in His Word because He knows that the thing that's going to change you and help you put off some things and put on other things is getting your mind on Him. So, next week, I know many of you, uh, it's going to be your last Sunday before you leave for some June and July vacations and things like that. Others of you, you'll be here and we'll continue on on this. But like next week, I've designed the whole message around the idea of how do we get the Word of God to dwell richly in us? Okay? That's at the end of the thing. Verse 16, it says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Think about that. What does that mean? Well, help you some more with that and hopefully send you off in a way that helps you set your mind on the things that are above and, and build a habit and a pattern in your life that would honor God, that you would help you to understand the identity that you have and to live that out. So a little bit of a preview there. I'm just telling you, I'm not going to cover all that in this message here. But applicationally, it does mean you've got to get your minds on the things that are above. And that's going to require you to be in God's Word. And I'll teach you more about how to do that next Sunday. But you can do that without that teaching. Just open God's Word and let's just start with Colossians chapter 3. I guarantee you, if you read this passage seven times in the next seven days, it's going to change how you think and how you act because you're putting your minds on the things that are above. So set your minds on the things above. The reason I, need a, I have a new identity and that's where it gets acted out. What you'll find is that having Christ is having everything. You're going to hunger for this. You're going to long for this when you see that more and more. But for our purposes today, one more thing that we see from this passage, write this down. Okay? As, we, as we're seeking, my identity as a Christ follower requires new habits of living. I know I have to put off some old things and put on some new things. And at the core of that is my identity, okay? So, so write this down. New life demands a new lifestyle. New life demands a new lifestyle. If this is your new identity, if you are a new creation in Christ, then that demands not because like there's somebody up there that's like, do this, do this, do this. It's just a simple matter of the character of the new identity that you have. And so in that we recognize that we need to have a new lifestyle to actually show the new identity that actually exists. I wrote it down this way. Identity determines activity. Is that true? Identity determines activity. Your identity determines your activity. So that, if this building were to catch on fire, okay, and suddenly the building was ablaze, uh, your identity would change your activity. I, I don't think anybody here is a fireman, okay? So all of us would flee out of the building, but if you were a fireman, it would change your activity. You would run into the building because you have a different identity, right? If we were to go to lunch and we were driving down there and we saw an accident on the side of the road, those of us here today who have no medical training might stop and make a phone call. We should, right? Stop, make a phone call, get the help that's needed there. But if you're medically trained, what are you required to do? Anybody? Help. Help. Like, it's against all moral law that you wouldn't stop and help, and it's against the law in actually some countries that you wouldn't stop and help because your identity determines your activity. You get that? And so if you say that you're a believer of Jesus Christ, it's not like your activity is demanded by God and is just a big bad God that just wants you to do this and that. So many times, that's the idea that's portrayed about God and His call to holiness in your life. That's not what it is. It, it's your identity determines your activity. So if you are in Christ, there's some things that you just can't and shouldn't and won't do anymore, and, and then other things that you will. And so it says here in verse 5, what activity is determined by this identity in Jesus Christ? Well, the activity is this, that you will put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Notice the strong language. 
you will put to death. Okay? That's not just like a metaphor that's like strong and you kind of get it. No, no, no. You will actually go out and seek to kill that which is earthly in you. You will seek to kill the sin that's in you. Like that's the activity that you are to engage in if you're a believer of Jesus Christ. If therefore you have been raised with Christ Jesus, you will put to death, you will kill the earthly things that are in you. And so in this, last week we talked about how we should be overwhelmed by the vastness of who God is and how that, that changes what our desires are. But, but can I also tell you that part of this isn't just like, I mean, that's true. That has to be first. But, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there should be an intentional plan in your life to get rid of some things that you know are wrong. So let me just ask you, let's just do a quick survey. What in your life is wrong against God, misses the mark, and is sin? Can you think of something? And then what's your intentional plan to take that off. That's what's being called for here. It goes on to say, hey, listen, not, some, not just some big things, but verse 8, but you must put them all away. Okay? Put away. So I think Paul, this is my little joke, okay? I think Paul was a mobster. Because first he tells us to kill some things, and then he says to put it away. And I think it means the same thing here, okay? Okay? He just wants you to put some fishes to sleep or, you know, something mobster-like in that way. But, but what he's saying, he's not going less on it is what I'm trying to get you to understand. He, he's saying, like, these things may seem less important, but they're just as important to actually go about the business of intentionally getting rid of. And then it tells us to put on some things. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility. It's interesting, when you look at these lists, if, you, I, if I, I was trying to boil them down to one thing, like, like put to death the selfish things and, and put on the selfless things would be a nice, just categorical way to look at this. So what are the habits in your life that indicate a reality that you have a new identity in Jesus Christ? And I'm not saying that those things are all going to go perfectly, but I am just going to ask you, what are the things that you're doing intentionally today to put off the things that don't please God and to put on the things that he has called for, that is part of his identity. You see, I think it's possible to come to faith in Christ Jesus, be baptized, sit in church, and have no intentional plan to put off and put on the things that indicate that reality. And I would say that would rot the soul. It rots relationships. It rots your life with God, and it doesn't end in a pretty place. But if we would just get a bit intentional about this, God would do a work that's above and beyond what we could ask or think in our lives. If we would just take Him seriously at His Word, that He wants you to put to death habits that are not of Him and put on habits that are, and that the way that you're going to do that is by getting your mind to the right place. You're going to have to do some other things. But notice in verse 9 and 10, it says, put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. When you get the knowledge of the identity, that's the image of its creator, okay? When you get the knowledge of the identity of Jesus, that changes things. You say, Pastor, I do want to change some things, but how do I do it? When you get the identity of the image of the Creator, it'll change you. That's why it says at the very end of this passage, in verse 17, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's not just the name Jesus, J-E-S-U-S. -S. 
that, that's the identity. When, when the biblical word talks about name, it's talking about the identity. You are now part of God's family. You have the name of Jesus on you. When, when you do that in the identity of Jesus Christ, that changes you. And so the thing that I'm really trying to help us understand today is that we need to cultivate habits of a new identity. And that doesn't mean that, that cult, you don't cultivate the new identity. That's given at faith in Jesus Christ. That's where you receive it. But that identity as a Christ follower then requires you to do some things to live differently. And that's the call of this passage on our lives. would you begin to intentionally put to death the things that are not of Christ and put on the things that are? The way is to set your mind on the things above, to seek the things that are above, to be renewed by the knowledge of the One who is above. That's where it happens. And then if you actually do what He tells you, which... Can I just say, every time, he has a way. It's repentance, every time. Okay, We could do a whole message on repentance. Maybe we need to do that someday. It's not today, but we know that that's the direction we go. It's repentance. When I change my mind about who God is and who I am, that changes my mind about what he's told me to do and not do, and therefore I begin to do and not do it. And if you're here today, and you're like, Pastor, I have the new identity, but I've been wearing the old clothes, and I'm seeing that I need to get some old clothes off of me and put on some new clothes, then it's something that begins in the mind. You're going to have to change your mind. That's repentance. When you change your mind and it changes your action, that's repentance. And that's the call of this passage here today. If you raised your hand earlier and said, my identity is Jesus Christ, then God has called you to respond in a particular way. To put off the things that are old, to put on the things that are new. It happens when you set your minds on the things above that will cause you to then repent and act differently. You can start that today.